The Chairman would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet or filmed and will be capable of repeated viewing or other use by third parties. If you are seated in the lower public seating area, it is likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and that this will result in the possibility that your image will become part of the broadcast. This may infringe your human and data protection rights. If you wish to avoid this, you should move to the upper public gallery. Thank you. Uh, since the last meeting, unfortunately, we have lost three previous councillors of this council, including one chairman. That's Freddie Lima, uh, Philip Pennell, and uh, Susan Perry. Very sad. They'd all given good service to this council. So please, can we be upstanding for one minute, sir? <laughs> Thank you, members. <clears throat> uh, Pretty Lima was, for quite a few years ago, he was uh, the Epping Ward from 74 to 79, Hemnall from 79 to 86. And he was vice chairman of the council in 82 to 83, and obviously he was chairman 83 to 84, and I think he's on the board here somewhere. Uh, now, I think Councillor Whitbread, you would like to. Thank you, Chairman. Chair, Chairman, I'm sure you'd probably like me to take each of the uh, yeah. councillors in, in, in order, if, if that's okay with yourself, yeah. rather than uh, carrying out an aerobic exercise of getting up and down. Um, Freddie Lima was one of those institutions in Epping for many years. It did a lot of good work for this council in its formative times. He was originally on Epping Urban Council as well as Epping Town Council. Um, really great servant of, of this district. I never had the pleasure of serving with him on the council, but he had a, a, a very highly regarded record in housing, um, which he was uh, awarded the MBE for um, going back many years. Um, I had the opportunity to attend his funeral yesterday along with yourself and other councillors and certainly it showed what a well respected person that he was over a period of time. Um, councillor Pennell, he was um, a councillor when I first came on the council, obviously of great reputation in Waltham Abbey and with a, a very good history and pedigree down there of doing good things for the local community. Um, I didn't know him personally but I know he was highly regarded within his group and in the council. Susan Perry. Now, Sue I knew really well. Um, Sue was a councillor on the town and district with myself, and she was highly regarded um, by local people. She did an awful lot. Sometimes you read the two short paragraphs on a page, and it doesn't say enough about what a person's actually done in their time as a councillor. And Sue really cared about Epping, and she was really passionate about the town. She was town mayor, um, did a wonderful uh, role as town mayor for uh, the year that she was doing that role. Um, she 
Right to the end, she cared about Epping. She, if you caught her in the high street, she would give you an earful about wasn't being, what wasn't being done and what was being done. But she kept in touch the whole time. Mm. And it's just so sad to lose Sue at such a young age, really, because um, I'm sure she would have been back for another term um, at some point in the future. Whereas, but she was enjoying her time with her grandchildren as such. So my condolences go out to all the families um, who have uh, lost her loved ones. Um, my thoughts are with them at this moment in time, particularly with to Sue's family with um, young grandchildren and such as well. So uh, my, my thoughts are there. Uh, I think that's all I can really say, Jim, that they're a sad loss to this district. Thank you. Yeah, Philip Pennell, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was the Labour councillor for uh, Waltham Abbey West, I think, from 1990 to 2002. And uh, he worked on just about every committee we had going. And I know uh, Councillor Murray would like to say something. Thank you, Chairman. I knew Philip very well. I was privileged to work with him for the whole of his 12 years on the District Council in the same group. He was an excellent colleague, had an absolutely astute understanding of his local community and the issues he was facing. He was a first class socialist and a wonderful leader who always brought his scientific training to the fore when putting an argument forward. And I can still see him tonight, Chairman. He used to sit in that row there. It's where the Labour group used to sit. And when he was the leader of our group, he sat there and forensically, due to his scientific training, was able to put forward an argument. He was simply a wonderful colleague who worked really hard for this district. For a period of time, he was the de facto leader of the council. He wasn't the leader of council by, by appointment, but no group had, uh, had a majority, so there was just informal relationships between the groups, and he was kind of de facto uh, the leader of the council. Colin Huckle was chair of PNC, and the two worked really well together. He was a leader who was prepared to listen to other people and respond appropriately. A wonderful skill. He was also a committed Christian and he did see his council duties as part of the instructions that all Christians follow, that you put your faith into action, deeds into action, faith into action. And uh, you always learn something about someone that you didn't know when you attend their Thanksgiving service. Uh, and it didn't really come as a surprise to me, but I didn't know this, that uh, the book, the guiding book for Philip, was uh, John Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress. And anyone who's read that book, and anyone who knows Philip, wouldn't be surprised that the two went together. So that's the tribute I want to make, Chairman. Uh, but I also want to make a tribute on behalf of someone else and, uh, about Philip, and I do have his permission. Uh, it's a former district councillor from Wolfham Abbey called Anthony Watts, which many of us know. I think he's done two different terms on this district council, and he's currently uh, mayor of uh, Wolfham Abbey. And he played an absolutely wonderful public tribute to, uh, to Philip, uh, and I do have... Uh, uh, Wolf Mary Councillor Watts' permission to, uh, to share his uh, tribute in the chamber tonight. Uh, in fact, he was delighted when I said I, would, I wanted to uh, share it. Uh, and this is what uh, Councillor Watts said in the, uh, the Guardian on August the 22nd. So, and, I, I, and I'll read it precisely. Uh, we really agree on the means by which issues were to be dealt with. So that's obviously Anthony and Philip but always agreed on the ends, the best interests of Waltham Abbey. Philip was always a man of high principles who served the community quietly but effectively. I, that's Anthony, always listened to his views and opinions, especially where they differed from my own, as I knew they were founded on the best of intentions. He especially championed the underprivileged and those less able to speak for themselves in the most persuasive manner. I, for one, will miss him. I agree 100% with Councillor Watts. A wonderful tribute. Thank you. Councillor Stafford. Thank you, Chairman. Unfortunately, I didn't 
uh, get to know uh, Philip Pennell very well because he came off district council as I was elected in 2002. So although I didn't know the man, I've certainly uh, learned a lot about his reputation and the legacy he's left in Waltham Abbey. I totally concur with um, Anthony Watts's tribute to Philip. He was always straight as a die, always had the best interests of Waltham Abbey as his foremost ob objective. And I do believe that um, his retirement from the council duties was um, entirely due to family ill health um, reasons. He is still respected, admired, and remembered for the man he was. And it was a privilege, however briefly, to follow in his footsteps, even if not in the same political interests. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Mr. Chairman, um, just I want to say a few words about uh, Freddie Lima. Um, as you know, he did 22 years on this council. Um, he was part of the, what Pat was saying earlier, the old school. He with Arthur Welsh, George Padfield, Ian Beatty, John Pledge, were, and um, Mick Welsh. Um, when I joined the council in uh, 1983, they made me so welcome, uh, looked after me. I think it's probably because John Pledge was a fellow farmer, that helped. But um, yes, they made me really welcome. And I always remember when we used to have the meetings up at um, Loughton Town Council, or uh, Loughton, Loughton Council Office it was, well, everybody, all the councillors had a um, little box, like we've got in the cabinet room here. And after the meetings, always had to have a drink afterwards. <laughs> and I've still got my key for the box here. I don't think I've ever been used since it was built. But um, yes, they were always very good. Uh, even so, when he retired in, uh, for the council in 1986, I used to see him in the high street here, um, ask him what's happening at the council, how are things going, and uh, right up to the end. I mean, he was 98 when he died. And uh, right up for a few years ago, he was still with it all the time. A great character, and uh, we'll really miss him. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. Yes, Freddie Lima, I knew only by, by reputation, but it's been said it was a big reputation, you know, reflected in the uh, you know, award he got of the MB, MBE, and more recently as a Freeman of, uh, of Epping. Um, with Philip Pinot, I did overlap with him on the council um, in my early, de early days uh, on the council. And I remember him, as, as Councillor Mary said, stood there as a thoughtful um, but powerful um, speaker and someone people listened to um, when he got up to speak. Um, and Sue Perry, um, I got to know a bit better as we served together on Epping Town Council and on uh, this council. And you know, she was, as been said, um, you know, committed to Epping and always you know, continue to turn out to events and occasions and so forth even after she left uh, both councils would always stop for a chat at the town show or um, in the high street um, and all three I know will be much missed by their, their families and friends um, and we send them our best wishes. Thank you uh, and also here of course we had Susan Perry who uh, was a district councillor for the Epping Hemlock Ward. I think that was um, shall we say, we know that board very well. <laughs> uh, she served on lots of the committees here and again was a hard-working, conscientious councillor. And I gather, Brian, you would like to... Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I'll just thank you for also Councillor Whitbread who uh, successfully took everything, although we didn't collude, I must admit, it, it, it shows the strength of Sue really, because I got more or less the same points that I was going to make. She was a feisty lady, um, no doubt about it. She called a spade a spade when they demanded, and I, I was on the rough end of her tongue at times, um, but she was a very good friend. Um, I was only here on the council my first year, and I think that was her last year, but I did serve for four years on the um, town council uh, when she was mayor and I followed on two years later and she was great help to me in that. Um, she had Epping entirely at, the, at her heart. She, there was nothing that she wouldn't do for Epping and it's nice that she's in good company tonight with the comments that have been passed about the two other former councillors. Um, everybody can appreciate it. It's unfortunate sometimes the recognition comes a bit late but nevertheless 
Sue was a very good friend. And he did, but it didn't stop her giving her opinion if you upset her. And finally, I will say this, like um, Councillor Whitbread, I will certainly miss it. I didn't know somebody else suffered the same way. Sometimes it was a good trip down the high road when you met Sue, but other times you could get crucified. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for those kind tributes. Item three minutes, they're on pages nine to 90. Um, can I take those as read? Anyone got any issues? Take them as read? Thank you. <coughs> Item four, declaration of interest. Anyone got any declarations of interest? No. Uh, announcements. Mr. Tolks. <coughs> Chairman, apologies for absence this evening from councillors Chambers, Hadley, Judy Jennings, Keska, Lee, Lyon and Sartin. Thank you. Sorry? Councillor Phillip. Chairman, apologies for lateness from Councillor Jones. Thank you. Okay, moving on to 5B Chairman's announcements. It's, as you know, I was away for a little while in the summer, but since I've been back, things have gone a bit chaotic, shall we say. Uh, very enjoyable this weekend. Uh, it was Battle of Britain Remembrance Day. And obviously with North Weald Airfield, uh, uh, we were privileged to have members of 56 Squadron come down, who, as you know, served at North Weald during the war. And we had a remembrance service at uh, St Andrew's Church in North Weald, which went very well. And I uh, took them to their older uh, mess, better known as the King's Head North Weald, uh, for a, a pint at lunchtime. And in fact, uh, they have invited us to go up and see them at their new base, which I, I shall do. Also, uh, just uh, you may have noticed some of you in your dips have a little thing I didn't quite have enough. I'm doing an Italian charity evening dinner in Chigwell on the 28th of October, all in aid of young carers. And believe it or not, I heard someone's phone, that's going to cost you dearly. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you, Mr. Sandler? <laughs> I will see you later. <laughs> now, uh, but it's going to be in the Papillon restaurant in Chigwell, which is a very nice restaurant. Um, it's all in aid of young carers, and believe it or not, there are 10,000 young carers in Essex. And I'm working with the group that look after all of our area very closely and they run clubs for them where they can actually get out of their home environment and act and behave with other children their own age and have a good time which they don't get much chance to do so it's an incredibly worthwhile charity so if you are free please let me know and come along it's it's a three course meal drink as you get there and i've arranged for a nice guitarist singer for the evening as well so it's a nice night out so please do. Also, uh, as part of the economic work, last year I held a business networking event in November, which went down very well, apart from the fact the M11 was closed that night and chaos ensued. Uh, but everyone that came said, we must do this again. So I shall be doing it again this year on the 28th of November. Um, it's champagne and canapes, which I pay for. Out my own poor little pocket. And uh, we're trying to get lots of the local business to come along in an informal way just to come talk, network, exchange views. It's free to them. So if you've got businesses that you think might benefit, please let me know. Or if you want to come along, please let me know and we will sort that out for you. Finally, quite fortuitously, fortuitously, something like that anyway. Uh, tonight you'll see on the agenda we have something on climate change. This council has been very conscious of this and one of the things that has been raised is single-use plastic bottles. So you will see everyone tonight has been given a proper multi-use <coughs> bottle, uh, which we will be using from now on. We will get rid of single-use plastic bottles. I've spotted that. Right, okay. But uh, I think it's very nice, so please, if you haven't got yours, it should be in your dip in the members' room, 
and uh, they're quite nice and we use so please make sure you get yours uh, the flowers tonight will be going to Parsonage Court in Loughton, the old people's home there. I realise I haven't, even though I know them quite well, I haven't sent them down there for a little while, so I thought it would be nice to send them down to them. OK, that, that's me done. Uh, public questions, have we got any? No chance. Thank you. Item seven, questions by members under notice. Again, no. OK, moving on to number eight, reports from the Leader and members of Cabinet. Uh, over to you, Mr Whitbread, or Councillor Whitbread, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, hasn't the summer gone by very quickly? It seems five minutes ago we were here on the 30th of July, and now here we are coming towards the end of September. And it shows what a busy time it's been for the Council, that it seems to have gone by in a flash over that period. And members, as you will be aware, that the council has been pursuing a new asset strategy um, in recent months and uh, we're act act actively pursuing development opportunities within the district with the um, emphasis being to increase our revenue streams uh, in the future and also to identify potential housing developments further down the, down the line. Obviously improving our revenue stream gives us that surety around being able to underpin frontline services in the future and giving us uh, peace of mind. So that's, that's very much what we're trying to achieve and we have got some potential acquisitions in the pipeline and I look forward to reporting further in, in the near future. <laughs> Members will also have uh, been aware from the news that um, Northwood Airfield has been granted special planning permission by the government for use as a customs hub when we leave the EU on the 31st of October. HMRC will be sending out 1,400 letters to local residents advising of the work starting and giving a contact point for any questions. The Council has negotiated with Government to ensure local and district residents see some benefits from the operations coming to North World. So this evening, um, <coughs> I'm pleased to announce that um, even though this is only on a temporary basis, Northfield Parish Council will receive £50,000 from the funds that we're receiving. So that's uh, an announcement that I'm making this evening, that 50000 of what we're receiving will go to Northfield Parish Council. Um, as will the local highways panel. Um, we always know the local highways panel is uh, short of funds to do some of the small projects that we wish to do, and it's my intention that £50,000 of that should go to the local highways panel to pick up on some of the uh, schemes that we haven't been able to do this year. So um, I'll be speaking with the local highways panel officer tomorrow uh, and making sure that comes about. Uh, other contributions are planned towards environmental improvements across North World, including master, master planning and green space provision. And I think that's whilst uh, <coughs> obviously we want everything to run smoothly on the 31st of October and after, it's important that the government makes the right provisions for any, any needs. So uh, it's good that the government has been working quickly over the summer and uh, making sure that we're ready to leave on the 31st of October. In addition to that, we've been continuing our work on St John's Road um, with a number of uh, key meetings taking place with officers, consultants and members. And I'm looking forward to bringing forward a report to the December Cabinet meeting, which will see the site options come forward and the opportunity for members to make the decisions on where we go forward. But uh, as members know, we want to put the new Epping Sports Centre on that site and we're looking forward to bringing forward the innovative consultation that we'll be doing on that site in December. Working with our partners across the district and more widely has seen a number of meetings take pl taken place. I've met with uh, Princess Alexandra Hospital and the CCG for, to engage in the significant changes being proposed across health and social care in West Essex. The PAH funding for the new hospital remains a challenge. The overall transformation in health continues with the STP activity becoming a focus area across West Essex and the importance of district representation is all too clear and we are working with our adjoining districts to make sure that they play an active role in the West Essex and Hertfordshire um, STP alliances as they're, as they're formed. 
At the Essex Leaders and Chief Execs meeting, a number of topics in, uh, affecting Essex authorities were on the agenda. You will hear from my co housing colleagues shortly about the, the meeting in London. Um, there's also um, a number of uh, ideas that were brought forward about empty, empty properties and uh, getting a cross-county strategic uh, view on that. Um, of course, the other big discussion that the uh, Essex leaders and chief execs was about Brexit and making sure that everyone was prepared. Looking forward over the next three months, a number of major projects will, will move to delivery phases. As you've heard me just mention, St John's Road is vital to that. And of course, the new development company, Land Transfer, will also be brought forward by December. In order to deliver these ambitious projects, the overriding activity leading up to December will be the budget setting for 2021 and beyond, where prioritisation, driving efficiencies and continuing to deliver quality frontline service to our residents will be at the forefront of everything that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got several other portfolio holders have indicated they've got updates. Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I wanted to bring a bit of good news to the... Uh, Council, uh, over the summer period there was a request for submissions to address a fund raised by the government uh, for enforcement against uh, illegal development, particularly emphasising on the green belt. This had to be over and above what we are already doing and Jerry Gordon went, put together a very sensible application on this in terms of how we can be proactive in looking to protect our green belt against development that shouldn't be there and incursions from people who should not be uh, building or developing on that green belt. I'm pleased to say that uh, in the recent announcement we have been granted £50,000 by the government to actually put in place those things that we've suggested. So look forward to us getting people in place to actually do that more proactive work on enforcement, which I think will help to give us reassurance uh, across the district that we are actually protecting the things that matter to us. Thank you. Councillor Stavrou. Thank you, Chairman. This is just a further update on the one very large outstanding rate appeal which has been hanging over our heads now for a number of years. I know my previous role as finance portfolio holder made allowances for it and we've been adding to, to that in the budget. Um, the valuation office have determined in favour of the company and they have said that they're wishing to reduce their business rate exposure. The claim covers several years and amounts to over £1.1 million. Repayment of the claim is covered by the provision we have already set aside for such uh, cases because obviously there are smaller um, appeals in the pipeline, as everyone is well aware. And of course, of this particular um, claim, other authorities and the central government are due to take a share of this loss later in the financial year. Um, and the impact for future years alongside other claims is being reviewed. So I will report back to members when relevant information is available to keep you all up to date. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to highlight in my report that there is the opening of Davis Court on the 8th of November, which all members are invited to, and we have our MP there. Also, as an additional thing, we have the um, local government minister, Luke Hall, come to visit us rather unexpectedly on Monday to look around the homeless pods at North Wheel. This is a really great opportunity to talk with the minister about what we're doing here in Epping Forest. We also showed him around Norway House. Um, it was a really, really positive meeting. We had a discussion afterwards, and a lot of credit was given to my predecessor, Councillor Sid Stavrou, and the team for all the hard work they've done, and also all the excellent work they do at Norway House. So it was really positive. Um, I know the minister, he took quite a lot of time, and he met the, me um, met the people who were living in the pod. So, yeah, really worthwhile, and good to have the recognition as well. Thank you. Councillor Bedford. Thank you, uh, I just wanted to update members on uh, our community police safety team. Uh, they've just had a recent success. I know there's been a bit of a problem in the district with stolen number plates. Um, they actually stopped a vehicle uh, last week, I think it was. Um, it wasn't stolen, but it was on clone plates. 
Uh, when they searched the vehicle, I believe they found a load of stolen tools inside, which is obviously a burden. And I think the tools have now been returned to the rightful owner over in Waltham Abbey. But the good news is that because the vehicle was being used on uh, cloned plates and it was not reported stolen, the police have taken the person's vehicle away from them. Um, and I would expect they'll probably get that sold as a proceeds of crime. Thank you. Thank you. Any other portfolio holder? Okay, thank you for that. We now move on to questions from members without notice. Okay, just one second. Okay, can we... Are we going round? While we're going round, I saw the first hand up. Councillor Mahindra. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question is to the planning portfolio holder, Councillor Philip. Uh, is he able to give us an update on where we are with the local plan? Just Thank you, checking Chairman. the list. Yes, I didn't want to interrupt you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Councillor Mahindra. That is what you call a very open question. Um, there is a lot to say about the local plan, and if I were to go on at complete length, I suspect I might use up all the Chairman's uh, time for questions quite easily. Since we had our last full Council, we have received uh, the interim letter from the Planning Inspector. Uh, it was quite a lengthy letter, um, comes up to all this number of pages, 21 of them in total. Um, the bottom line, I think, is that overall it's a very good uh, letter for us. Uh, the things that it doesn't say are equally important as the things it does say. Uh, there is no suggestion in the letter that we have failed in our duty to cooperate. If we had failed in our duty to cooperate, that is something that cannot be resolved through an examination in public. There's no suggestion that legally we are unsound, which again is a very positive thing. There's a number of things that we need to take on board and do work with, and once we've done the first bits of preparatory work on that, we will be going back in a reply to the inspector, clarifying what it is that we are intending to do, when we intend to do it, by and how we intend to move forward and the things that she's asked us to do. We haven't yet got to the point where we can write to the inspector because I want to make sure that once we know what our new schedule is, it's a new schedule that we can stick to. Uh, I've been very clear ever since I took on this portfolio that when we stick milestones in the ground, judicial reviews accepting obviously, uh, we keep to that schedule. There's a number of things that we need to do some work on. Probably the biggest one is in terms of the special area of conservation uh, and for that our habitats regulation. Uh, it's unfortunate that up until almost immediately before the particular session with the inspector, Natural England had made no indication that they were unhappy with our methodology. In fact, all the indications coming down the line had been that we were getting towards a, an agreement on that. Um, so for that to actually come out at uh, the inquiry in public itself was unfortunate. Um, we did defend very robustly uh, our habitat regulation assessment. We still believe in uh, that habitat regulation assessment, though it is worth saying that a number of different uh, regulations have come out in the time since uh, the inquiry in public closed which we have to now take on board. We couple that with changes in things in the plan that we need to look at, uh, both the extraction from the plan of Limes Farm and Jessel Green, the need to look again at the convent site in Chigwell, a site in Royden which we'd allocated for a small number of houses which the uh, developer believed was no longer viable at that level. That has to come out. We have to look at the phasing uh, of development around both Harlow East and South Epping. And with South Epping, it may be a case of changing the numbers there as well. Once we've done all those assessments, we then need to factor that in to things like the transport assessment. What's that going to have an effect on the transport assessment? And only once we've done that can we then go on 
and rerun our habitats regulation assessment and our sustainability assessment. So I guess I'm flagging up now, Councilman Hendrick, this is not going to be a particularly quick activity. We will obviously do it as quickly as we can, but it's important, as with all of the things in the local plan, that we do it right the first time. We don't keep going round and round and round. So that's why we'll be touching base with the inspector to make sure that what we're intending to do actually does address the things she's raised in her letter. <laughs> we'll be going circling around with the various people, TfL, for example, with their uh, developments on the Loughton and Debden uh, car park sites. We were very clear to them beforehand we said, this is what we've done, and we said it at this level because that doesn't have an impact on the surrounding areas. If you go in for 12 or 13 storeys, that doesn't fit with the surrounding area. We would strongly recommend that because we will not be able to support it. And that's what the inspectors come back with. So we have to work with them. We have to work with Natural England. We have to work with the conservators of Epping Forest to get all this in the right place. I wish I could tell you how long a piece of string is. I can't do that at the moment. As soon as I can, I will come back to Council and let, let you know <coughs> what's happening. Um, we will continue to report on progress through the Local Plans Cabinet Committee, um, but we're not finished yet. Hopefully that addresses most of the things around that. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Natman. Um, I think it is, but don't worry. Um, my question is to the planning portfolio holder. Um, I did give him a, a, a question in writing, but um, because we were day or so late on it, um, I know he's got an answer, but I'm not going to look for a detailed answer tonight. And my question is one that I've raised, I think, last January stroke February, about why we have not as yet got the environmental levy or the environmental impact assessment um, requirements from the Natural England, um, which means that we now currently have over 200 dwellings which we can't build, which have been given a resolution to grant because we don't know exactly what they're looking for um, as either a payment or some sort of changes in the way the buildings are operate. Um, so what I'm asking is, can you give us any idea um, when we might know about this and whether there is any way we can use the, the, the view that the impacts must be significant because we have small developers who are now facing catastrophe and the audit committee we've identified that there is a potential loss of 600,000 a year um, for the three councils who receive um, their council tax um, from this uh, delay, which is no, I don't know, I'm guessing two years, could be four years. Natural England, as I said last time, behaviour in this is a disgrace. And I repeat that, that they've left 2,400 workers, they have any number of offices all over the country, but only one telephone number for all of them. And I have emailed them, I've asked them, I've received no response whatsoever while we're getting the delay. It's becoming more and more, it seems to me, technical. And I would ask the portfolio, how to, can you please keep the council updated on where we are? Because we are facing a real crisis in the district because of this activity, or lack of activity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Philip. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, Councillor Natman, and I did actually speak about this at the Stronger Place Select Committee earlier on this week. Um, I do recognise the significant problem that it's actually causing a number of our small developers uh, in the district. Uh, you provided me earlier with a very detailed question for which I have a draft detailed answer. Once we've fit completed that, I will share that with you, and then once we've done that, I will try and get that into uh, the Council's public domain through the bulletin. Uh, I don't promise that for next week. This has been going on now for about 15 months. It was about June last year that we got the instruction from Natural England. Um, I concur with Councillor Natman that sometimes getting information out of Natural England is nowhere nearly as quick as we would like. 
we have been looking at a number of different ways where we can actually uh, address this problem sensibly. Um, we don't want to get in a point where we're fighting with either Natural England or the Conservatives because that doesn't help anyone. We're trying to work together. We did, much earlier in this year, around February time, actually provide to Natural England a list of small developments which we believed we could potentially grant planning permission to um, w still working under the constraints that Natural England has put on us. Um, I have to say to this at this stage, we haven't yet had a formal answer to that. That's not through lack of chasing on our part. I know it's been chased at least twice this week alone, um, and we will not take our foot off that one. We are looking as creatively as we possibly can to try and break this logjam and still uh, fulfil our requirements around the special area of conservation. Just to make it very clear, it's not like the visitor's pressure where we actually have a mitigation strategy in place and agreed through Natural England, through the Conservatives. That is very clear. We know how much money each particular development needs. We don't yet have an agreement with Natural England as to what needs to be done to make these developments acceptable. And just to be really careful here, it's not the impact of an individual development that's needed to take into account. The case law is very clear. It's a single development and in conjunction with all other developments happening. And that's where the real ch challenge comes from. And that's why it's a non-trivial problem. But that's why we believe with these small developments which would have been happening on windfall sites and happening, have been happening over the last few years going forward, that we are in a strong position. Uh, Councillor Knappman has my assurance that we will not stop pushing that one to try and get it through, because in general, it is those small developers that are have it, having the problem. They, they are important to us. Um, yes, they, they bring in council tax, but that's not the reason. We want to see those, those developments happening in the right place. If they hadn't been the right developments in the right place, we wouldn't have been looking to grant them planning permission. One flag of warning, because significant regulations have changed since we resolved either as a delegated decision or as a planning committee to grant planning permission, we will have to relook at all those that we've resolved to grant permission but not issued before we issue the permissions to make sure that nothing in terms of the regulations has changed to make that decision no longer sound. Um, if I get good news, I will let the council know at the next council meeting, and if it's good news significantly before that, I will find a way of letting the council know that some of the log jam has been unjammed. Thank you. Councillor Neville. Thank you, Mr Chairman. This is a question to the portfolio holder for contract and technical services, and I've already primed him that this is going to come his way. Um, the question is about the uh, parking on grass verges in Cascade Road in my ward, which has been a bit of become increasingly an issue, and he kindly took up the issue for me some months ago. I would like to uh, ascertain what sort of uh, resolution we may be looking at. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Neville, for that um, question. Um, we have corresponded by email over the last 24 hours about this, and I, I am afraid I did drop the ball a bit on this when sick leave over the summer. However, um, I, I, I realise, um, and I agree with you actually, that perhaps yellow lines are not the way to go with this particular issue, and I will be going back to offices to discuss some of the other options that we did discuss earlier in the year. Uh, and see if we can get those resolved and put in place. And I will do a site visit as well now. Up and running again. Thank you. Thank you. Rather than sit down, Councillor Avery, I gather you wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Chairman. It's good of you to think about my, uh, my problems, but uh, yes. Um, and I, I'm doing my best here to uh, not rush to the toilet. Um, it, it's a question actually for Councillor Phillip, uh, Planning Services Portfolio Holder, and I'm asking this question not as a Cabinet Member, but as the War Councillor for Broadley Common, Epping Upland and Nasing. 
Um, I recently attended a, a, a Royden Parish Council meeting with the developer of the Water Lane um, site, which forms part of the sites in the uh, submitted local plan. There was considerable concern amongst the parish councillors about future traffic infrastructure around that area. Um, can Councillor Phillip provide some assurance around the work being done as part of the local plan and the master planning of this site that traffic infrastructure issues will be addressed? Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, and that probably strikes, reminds me that I didn't say very much about the Harlan Gilson Garden Town when I was talking earlier about the local plan. Sorry for that, Councillor Mendra. Um, obviously, our three major sites around the Harlan Gilson Garden Town are a significant part of our local plan. We are working on them as part of the local plan, but we also work on them as part of the overall Harlan Gilson Garden Town and the board which oversees the work that's done there. And there is actually a separate garden town team that looks after a whole number of things with representatives on, from the officers of both ourselves, Harlow and East Hearts working together. There are a whole number of work streams that are going on around that 10, 10 or 12 at the last count, although we're looking to see if we can actually reduce the number of work streams to make it a bit more efficient. One of those work streams is, in fact, sustainable transport. One of the visions around the Harlow and Gilson Garden Town is actually a modal shift away from private use vehicles. Um, for, to that end, um, if you've seen any of the Garden Town uh, in exhibitions, in fact there was one downstairs um, last year showing things like this, it shows that we have, as part of the Garden Town, a sust sustainable transport corridor running from the north in Gilson down to the south in Latin Priory and from the east in Harlow East all the way across the west at Water Lane. The aim here is to move to having 60% of all journeys not being taken by private vehicle. It's a very ambitious target and it ties in fact to what uh, Councillor Neville and myself will be talking about later in terms of climate change. <laughs> We need to be able to reduce emissions. We need to be able to reduce congestion. And you can only reduce congestion by reducing the number of vehicles. It's not sufficient just to move from petrol or diesel driven to electric or other technology. As part of the Harlow and Gilson Garden Town work, there is a very detailed infrastructure uh, plan which builds on the infrastructure plan in each of the three local plans. What that will mean is that uh, the amount of infrastructure needed for Harlow Gilson Garden Town actually results in a significant burden on each house developed there. And that, as members who came to the viability session that we had in this council chamber will realise, that is part of the cost of doing development. Last time they looked, I think it was looking at somewhere around about £55,000 per dwelling in terms of the charge that we're going to need to take. And a significant amount of that will be to make sure that the infrastructure for transport, and I'm not saying necessarily all roads in terms of carways, that will be provided for. And if we can make sure that those movements are driven away from the private vehicles into at the sustainable transport corridors, which may be rapid transit, it may be walking, it may be cycling, it may be other ways. And then making sure that those sustainable transport corridors are actually things that will be used. I think we're all familiar with the fact that underpasses to go under big roads is a good idea, but they were designed in such a way that nobody actually wants to use them. So we have to make sure when we do those sustainable transport corridors that they are things that people are going to want to use. If we can get that happening, then we'll be able to reduce the impact on the roads, even with not changing the infrastructure, but we do still need to factor infrastructure around Water Lane and the other Garden Town sites and make sure that we get a better place for people to live. You're talking well tonight, Councillor Phillip. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. My question is fairly low key, but uh, just uh, a courtesy one. I hadn't intended asking the question, but as soon as I heard Councillor Holly Whitbread, 
uh, this question came to mind. So this is for the uh, Housing and Property Services portfolio holder. Uh, would you give some consideration on the basis, and I think I'm correct, that Davis called his uh, uh, name because of uh, the long-standing councillor, Joan Davis, uh, and she's invited all the councillors. Would you give some consideration, please, to uh, inviting Joan's family to uh, the opening of Davis Court? Uh, her son lives in my ward, so if contact is needed, but I think that would be a very nice touch if Joan's family could be invited. Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you, Councillor Murray, for that question. And I believe that um, Councillor Davis's family have already been invited and are attending. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Bolton. Thank you. Just a short one, uh, directed to, again to Holly Whitbread, um, Housing and Property Services Portfolio Holder. It was interesting to read that she recently attended a Property Weeks conference and she was talking about the homeless pods uh, in North Weald. I, I would be happy if you could report back to us a bit in detail about this particularly in its effect in house homelessness within the district and the satisfaction of the residents. Thank you. Council Ripper. Thank you, Councillor Bolton, for that question. Yes, I had a pleasure of having a trip to Wales for the first time last week. So I, I was invited to the Property Week conference following an article I wrote about the work we're doing here with the homeless pods. And actually, I think it shows the fact that the Minister took an interest in what good work we are doing here in Epping Forest. So while there, I took an opportunity to talk about how it was an innovative how, um, solution to homelessness and how other councillors have done similar things and taken similar approaches. And actually, what was really interesting is I was on the panel with lots of different people who had done all sorts of amazing kind of charity projects around homelessness. So one of the guys had um, actually used empty houses and he used it to find people an address so they could apply for bank accounts and apply for jobs, which is actually one key issue with um, homelessness. So I actually, I did learn a great deal from it. So it was a really worthwhile trip. And there was a lot of kind of praise for the council's approach and looking at different kind of proactive measures we can take to address homelessness. And in terms of the residents within the pods, I understand that they are almost full. I believe there's one empty currently, and those who are living in them are finding the experience okay, and it's preferable really to bed and breakfast, both in terms of cost for the council, but also for the individual, because there's a lot more independence. You get living in the pogs, obviously you've got your own kitchen and you're not reliant on the high street for food. So yeah, so I think they're going well so far, and thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dole. Um, thank you, Chairman. My question is for the portfolio holder for contracts and technical services. Uh, try not to strain your neck, Nigel. Um, given, <laughs> given fly tipping is at epidemic levels, uh, would the portfolio holder assist myself and the other local councillors in making representations to Essex County Council with regard to reversing or relaxing both the reduction in opening hours and the stricter controls on permitted waste items at Waltham Abbey Recycling Centre? Councillor Avey. If it would help, you can uh, sit down. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for that question, Councillor Doyle. Yes, unfortunately, fly tipping is re reaching epidemic levels. Um, every day now, I think we have more reports of fly tipping. Um, and I find it strange that Essex have always held out that um, uh, the restrictions on the municipal waste dumps is no way uh, related at all to fly tipping, which is really just counterintuitive and rather silly. Um, and I think we should push Essex, and we have been pushing Essex, to do something about this uh, and allow longer opening hours and remove some of the restrictions. So instead of seeing this rubbish on our roads and in hedgerows and so forth, we actually see it in the right place in the dump. And on that note, I would say uh, Biffa and the waste team do a fantastic job going around quickly picking up, which is increasingly unpleasant amounts of rubbish left everywhere over the district. Thank you. Councillor Wixley. Right, thank you, Chairman. Yes, my question is to the Housing and, um, and Property Services Portfolio Holder. 
uh, Councillor Holly Whitbread. And my question is actually very closely related to the question from Councillor Murray earlier regarding uh, the naming of the, the court, Davis Court, after uh, for, uh, the late councillor, Councillor Joan Davis. Um, I noticed in the report it's spelt with an E, and I just like to, I'm sure that's just a typo, but it would be highly embarrassing if, uh, on the 8th of November, if it was spelt wrongly there. And of uh, course, her name is up on the board there, I was chairman of this council from 1994 to 95. Thank you. Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you for that question and spotting that. I'll be checking that straight away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor John Whitehouse. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, if I could ask the Cabinet Member responsible for the accommodation strategy for an update on where we are with the um, costings and feasibility of the land behind the civic offices um, and the possibility of a uh, new building at North Weald, particularly you know, in the light of the discussions held as part of the informal call in earlier this year. Thank you. Is that you, Councillor Whitbread? Yes, Chairman, as, um, as I said, it's been a busy summer and there's certainly been a lot of work going on around the accommodation strategy over the summer. Um, and I'm looking forward to a report coming forward in October to Cabinet. In fact, I think I've just stepped on someone else's toes, by the sounds of it, from behind me. But um, there will be a report coming forward in October. The work has been done. I'll be going to North World. Let's see what the report brings in October. Thank you. Councillor Barrows. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this is a, uh, for the Leader of the Council. Would it be possible for him to give a fuller update on the progress of St John's, St John's development in Epping as it's in my ward? Thank you, Chairman. As I said earlier on this evening, we're making progress on St John's Road. Um, we're, we're speaking to consultants. Um, we, we are looking at the options. In fact, we're meeting in the next week as uh, with the Cabinet and other members to uh, look at uh, what the consultations, uh, the consultants' work is coming back with. Um, we're in discussions with, with the Town Council and um, we're looking forward to bringing forward a full report to Cabinet in December so we can take the decisions to move it forward to the next stage which will be a planning application and uh, doing something really good for the district. Thank you. Councillor Plummer. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is another question for the Contract and Technical Services portfolio holder, a um, bit of a follow-up to Councillor Doyle's question a moment ago. Uh, as the Councillor may be aware, I've been campaigning to try and get um, permits for small vans and trailers to use Waltham Abbey's Recycling Centre for a couple of years now, and I've been coming against a bit of a brick wall with the, with the County Council. I started a petition recently, but that's as a Green Party petition, so not really suitable for <laughs> promotion here. Sorry. Um, would uh, Councillor Avery agree with me that, that introducing permits would be a reasonable compromise um, by opening up the, the uh, recycling centre to residents with domestic waste while also preventing, or at least helping to prevent, um, commercial fly tipping at the site? And is this something that we can pursue with the County Council? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Avery. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for that question. Well, I see no reason why we shouldn't consider that, because I think that's part of the problem, is a lot of the restrictions placed are leading to more rubbish, and um, obviously out of the back of white vans, I would imagine. Um, so uh, I think there is something to be done on that, and uh, we need to convince Essex County Council that, they, that they're wrong, and they should do something about the restrictions and everything else. Thank you. Uh, last question tonight, Councillor Janet Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. My question is to the Portfolio Holder for Commercial and Regulatory Services, and it's a part of your report on anti-idling. Um, I think you'd be pleased to hear that one of the residents who originally raised the issue of air pollution at Epping Station has um, emailed me and the officer to say that he has noticed some of the bus drivers are now turning off their engines. Um, unfortunately, not the taxi drivers. Um, there is a, an, an issue now in Berry Road where parents collecting children from school are idling their engines and a resident's been talking to them and had some, some success with some but abuse from the others. So it would be good if the officer could go down to Berry Road and, uh, and do some work down there. You mentioned about um, the FPNs, so not many have been, um, they have to uh, uh, give uh, 
warnings first, and uh, so not many have been uh, issued, I don't think any have been issued. Um, I would like to draw attention to the difference between an FPN for air pollution and other FPNs. The officers who can issue FPNs for littering just have to see the offence. They don't have to say to the resident, please pick up that bit of litter, otherwise you'll get an FPN. Similarly with parking. The, the parking warden merely needs to see that you've parked on the yellow line. He doesn't say to the driver, would you like to move your car? And you know, Then you didn't have an FPN. It does seem that these FPNs for um, air pollution are really out of kilter with everything else. And I have spoken to our MP about that, and she said she would take it up with DEFRA. But do you agree that they're unsatisfactory? And that we do need more officer resources to deal with this problem of air pollution, because it is a big one. And I did ask the last council meeting for an education campaign. Just wonder how that's progressing as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Patel, I think that's you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Whitehouse, for your question. Um, I'm glad, to know, I'm glad to know that, the, uh, that the, uh, the person that raised the complaint about the, the buses um, has seen an improvement in that. Um, with regards to the taxi drivers, again, it, and, and as you're aware of the legislation, it's one of those where in order to um, take suitable action, you have to be present, observe it, um, warn, and then you're in a position to be able to issue a, um, a penalty notice. The actual legislation, I've, I've, I actually bought it with me, um, and uh, it's, um, it's, it's quite a lengthy regulation, so I'm happy to share, share that link with you. However, it's, it is legi legislation, it is government legislation, and that's what we are tied to. Um, with regards to Berry Road and the school, as you would have read in the report, we've got five banners now that have been um, uh, printed and we are happy to circulate that around any areas of concern um, which councillors bring forward. Um, uh, we've, we've, uh, we've placed those banners up at the train station and are looking to do so at, at Bell Common as well. Um, but uh, this is open to all councillors to bring forward any concerns in their in their town and parishes um, to, um, to, to, to raise that with our officers and, and we'll take that forward. Regarding the, uh, the wider issue um, about the message throughout the district, I think we all have a responsibility here in, in terms of um, sharing uh, the message. Um, certainly uh, councillors who are dual-hatted town and parish councillors with, with the, there's, uh, as part of the National Clean Air Campaign, um, we, we have um, promotional literature which can be used, um, that can be circulated um, around to local residents via parish council magazines, for example. Um, we've, we've now, now that the schools are back, now we, we are going to uh, re-engage with the schools and, and, and with the parents to, to raise awareness around that again. We, um, but with regards to this and, and other um, public health um, issues that arise, it's all well and good raising the issue now, so raising awareness about an issue now, but how do you do it on a concerted basis throughout the course of um, a year? And that is the challenge, and, as, um, and with limited resources it is, it is a challenge. But again, it comes down to uh, coordination and working with partners um, in, in getting that message across. Thank you. I, I been asked just for one quick question, Councillor Pond. Sorry, Chairman, I did indicate, but you didn't notice me. Uh, oh, you know, shame, shame. But you, you, your glasses are, are different, so no, maybe. No, look to the right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Chairman, the, um, the Epping Society and the Larton Residents Association, those two radical organisations, have both <laughs> recently expressed serious concerns about overcrowding on the central line and in particular one might mention that the interchange station at Stratford now handles about 150 million people a year which will become even worse after Crossrail. Uh, the serious overcrowding has in, in uh, our view uh, extended into what used to be called the peak shoulders. Uh, so is there something that the uh, 
district council can do. Will the portfolio holder please uh, meet London Transport, uh, Transport for London rather, to discuss central line issues and in particular to try to mitigate the awful journey that many of our uh, residents have into central London every day? Okay. Who would like that one? <laughs> Councillor Philip? Uh, Chairman, as I, I have already mentioned, um, we will be talking to London Transport anyway. We do consult them uh, on a regular basis. We do reflect uh, the issues that we, we perceive in terms of pressure on the central line. Um, I know uh, London yeah. Transport have in previous uh, times actually attended overview and scrutiny and be scrutinised there. Um, I shall certainly mention the issues that we have with um, transport next time we're talking to, uh, to, to TfL. Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily within the gift of this council to address uh, congestion problems on the central line by the time it comes to Stratford, which is not even in one of our neighbouring mm. boroughs. Um, but uh, Councillor Pond can rest assured that we will keep talking to them and trying to encourage uh, better use of the trains to make it uh, more acceptable. Thank you. I've allowed 35 minutes. I think that's pretty good. So let's move on now to item 10 motions. We have one on uh, climate emergency and it it's proposed by Councillor Stephen Neville. Would you like to read your motion? I will read the motion, yes indeed. That the council notes humans have already caused irreversible climate change, the impacts of which are being felt around the world. Global temperatures have already increased by one degree Celsius from pre-industrial levels. Atmospheric CO2 levels are above 400 parts per million. This far exceeds the 350 per parts per million deemed to be safe, a safe level for humanity. Two, in order to reduce the chance of runaway global warming and limit the effects of climate breakdown, it is imperative that we as a species reduce our CO2 equivalent emissions from their current 6.5 tonnes per person per year to less than 2 tonnes as soon as possible. Three, individuals cannot be expected to reduce, to make this reduction on their own. Society needs to change its laws, taxation, infrastructure, etc., to make low carbon living easier and the new norm. Four, carbon emissions result from both production and consumption. Five, Epping Forest District Council has already shown foresight when it comes to addressing the issue of climate breakdown, having signed the Nottingham Declaration on Climate Change, written Environmental Sustainability Policy and Action Plan, and having worked to use renewable energy and energy efficiency, and have had a Green Working Party driving the agenda for some years. Six, unfortunately, our current plans and actions are not enough. The world is on track to overshoot the Paris Agreement's 1.5 de degrees Celsius limit before 2050. Seven, the, the IPCC's special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius published in the autumn of 2018 describes the enormous harm that a 2 degrees rise is likely to cause compared to a 1.5 degree rise and told us that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius may still be possible with ambitious action from national and sub-national authorities, civil society, the private sector, indigenous peoples and local communities. And eight councils and parliaments around the world are responding by declaring a climate emergency that, and committing resources to address this emergency. That the Council believes that all governments, national, regional and local, have a duty to limit the negative impacts of climate breakdown and local governments that recognise this should not wait for their national governments to change their policies. It is important for the residents of Epping Forest District and the UK 
that local authorities commit to carbon neutrality as quickly as possible. The consequences of global temperature rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius are so severe that preventing this from happening must be humanity's number one priority. Bold climate action can deliver economic benefits in terms of new jobs, economic savings and market opportunities as well as be improving, improved well-being for people worldwide. And, finally, that the Council resolves to declare a climate emergency, pledge to do everything within the Council's power to make Ep Epping Forest District Council area carbon neutral by 2030, call on Westminster to provide the powers and resources to make the 2030 target possible, work with other governments, both within the UK and internationally, to determine and implement best practice methods to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius, continue to work with partners across the district and region to deliver the new goal to all relevant strategies and plans, in the special circumstances of this district, resolves to protect the special area of conservation through the local plan and every other means, and finally, and I do mean finally, implement an air quality strategy and bring forward sustainability guidance on planning. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Phillips. Do you wish to uh, say anything now? Reserve your right. Thank you. Uh, has anyone any comments on this? Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I did speak to Councillor Neville before the meeting, and he kindly agreed to accept my amendment, um, which is that the Council engage young people when considering the issue of climate change and appoint a youth ambassador from the Youth Council. Obviously, the Youth Council is the generation who will be most affected by climate change, and I think it would be really good to engage them. I would like to note, however, that this government have done more than previous governments to actually acknowledge the dangers of climate change. And Theresa May's legacy, or well, one of her legacies, was legislating to uh, make the UK carbon neutral by 2050. So it is worth noting that there has been more movement from this, I won't get too political since we're all agreeing tonight, um, Conservative government than many others. But yeah, the main point I wanted to make was just in relation to the importance of youth engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a uh, seconder for the amendment? <laughs> Councillor Pond. Chairman. Ca Sorry? Chairman, I actually believe that the motion, the, the amendment in writing has been provided to the Democratic Services. I was services just about to ask that same question. And was seconded by Councillor Neville. Ah, thank you. So you've got it in writing. And it's been seconded by Councillor Neville. Sorry. Um, do you accept, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask, do you actually accept the amendment or do we want to debate the amendment? Since I seconded it, I will accept it. <laughs> I thought I'd better ask formally though, so we accept the amendment so we can go back uh, to the original one. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not going to respond to the comment about uh, Mrs May's legacy. But I certainly don't think the legacy will be uh, climate change, I have to say, and action on the environment. I can think of a few other things. Uh, I just want to make three points. Two, I think, will be OK. Uh, the third will be more controversial. Obviously, fully support this. Uh, I'm an optimist by nature, but I have to say that my understanding of the science and where we are environmentally is I think we've left it too late myself. A lot of experts will say that some of the trends that we are witnessing are irreversible. And I mean that in all seriousness, but we've got to do what we can. But I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that we haven't left it too late. I don't mean we as a council. I mean we as mankind. Secondly, it is important we do something because climate change will hit us eventually, but it's already hitting the most vulnerable and the poorest parts of our world community. And we have to realise that, that it is an issue now. We talk about our young people in the future, and that's fine, fully understand that. But in 
the most affected part of the world, climate change and the effects of climate change, is a living reality now. The third point, which I think will be slightly more controversial, uh, but I, I just feel it, we can all support this motion, but the spirit behind it has to be behind some of the decisions we make as a council. And I just look at one issue, and it's in, in my home turf. I look at how badly delivered and how badly planned our retail park was. No integrated transport. It seems almost to have been designed and situated to maximise the number of cars that are permanently in a queue with their engines running. You go to that junction, who builds a retail park, apart from Open Forest District Council, with no integrated public transport, on the edge of an industrial estate, where cars are wanting to get out, and there's one way in and one way out, and it's the same route. It's designed to maximise the environmental impact. So what I am saying is that by all means support this motion, but it's got to go through all the policies and all the issues that we face, and there will be some decisions that won't be popular out there, but are the right decisions to make if we actually really support this. So I have to say my overriding feeling is I'm very pessimistic, and I think the science tells me that as a group of people across the world, we've actually left it too late. Thank you. Councillor Plummer. <laughs> ah, ah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't normally write notes down, so it'll be a bit more stilted than normal. Um, the climate emergency is the most single important issue that we face, and reducing its impact is the single most important thing that any of us as individuals and councillors can do. Um, I won't go into the arguments for it, as you've read them in the motion and you've heard them on the media. Um, they're very well put. But something that can be forgotten is the secondary benefits. Uh, for example, as you're probably aware, or you may be aware, I organised litter picks in Waltham Abbey. Uh, there's one coming up this Saturday. If anyone fancies getting their feet wet in Coppins Brook, you're welcome. Um, one, of the biggest, most, one of the biggest things we pick up is single-use plastic bottles. They're everywhere. Um, so a secondary... Not anymore, no. That's brilliant. And actually, that brings up, as a Waltham Abbey town councillor, um, like I say, how proud I am of my town council um, for introducing... Um, our little Waltham Abbey branded plastic bottles for sale in the Tourist Information Centre a couple of years ago. We were ahead of the game here in Epping Forest by doing that and looking at further things going forward that we can do to help combat climate change. Um, but there are other, there are other wider things um, by reducing CO2 emissions and increasing our use of renewable energy. Uh, we're not only helping um, our communities um, reduce their fuel bills, increase their health. Um, and um, reduce CO2 generally, but also something people don't seem to think of much. We're reducing our reliance by increasing our, our use of renewable energies. We're, re we're reducing our reliance on despicable regimes that are oil rich, such as Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't think anybody in this room would want us to be trading with them more than we need to. But Sorry, Mr. The, the climate emergency. Plummer, Hold on, Plummer, yeah. I, I think we have to be careful where we go here. I can see where you're going. Yeah, I'm, I'm and just saying. That I don't think we can criticise other countries at this meeting. Well, the human rights record is public record. Yeah, but that might be public record, but it's outside the motion that's in front of us. I'm, all right, I'm just saying, that, okay, let's say, by reducing our reliance on oil, we reduce, we increase our ability to make ethical investments. Right, how's that? Um, uh, yeah, anyway, um, also public transport, um, increased active travel, reduces health costs in the long term, reduces child asthma, child asthma in the short term. So yeah, please support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I was pleased to see this motion reach the agenda after quite a lot of discussion over the last few months, including some useful engagement with groups outside um, the Council. I had a particularly interesting meeting with um, representatives of one of the local church groups uh, later in, uh, earlier in the year who've been quite involved in uh, you know, promoting and uh, putting forward uh, you know, this issue for discussion. And the motion quite rightly sets out the, uh, the scale and the importance of the challenge ahead of us locally, nationally and, uh, and internationally. 
was pleased to see the um, motion reference some of the things the council said previously, the Nottingham Declaration, which I remember proposing here. I think we also had a debate on the 1010 initiative um, about nine years ago. And I think the lesson of those is that it's how you implement the action following you know, these declarations and these commitments which matters you know, more as much um, as the words themselves. The words, the words you know, set the tone and set the commitment and show the council thinks these are important. And it's what then the council does to follow up um, which uh, is important. And what that needs is sustained commitment from all councillors, but particularly the leadership of the council, both political and the managerial and the officer side, to make sure that the commitments that we're making tonight are actually flow through into the council strategies and the council's plans. Obviously, we've got the budget um, beginning or in preparation at the moment. It's important that this um, declaration is reflected in what the budget says. It's important um, that when the corporate strategy is refreshed, you know, this is um, reflected in it. We've already heard talks about the links from the local plan and the climate, um, climate change and climate strategies. The Green Working Party did some good work, but it was a bit stop-start depending on who turned up and uh, you know, what com commitment it has and which cabinet member is in charge. And it's important we don't get, uh, get trapped by that again. So, very pleased with the amendment as well. I hope members will support this um, very wholeheartedly um, this, after, um, this evening. But I hope when we hear the seconder speech, he'll talk a bit about how progress has been monitored and evaluated and, for example, come back to scrutiny um, for report. Thank you, Chairman. Count, uh, Councillor Leopard. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I uh, just want to say that uh, I think before any of us consider passing this motion and then uh, patting each other on the back for saving the planet at tonight's meeting, I do think we should uh, take a look at the, uh, the validity of the whole uh, carbon-driven climate change campaign, as well as the, uh, the various agendas and motivations of some of the people who, are, who propagate these theories with the, the most fanatical zeal. Now, of course, the, the climate change alarmists are very fond of telling us that 98% uh, of scientists agree with them, aren't they? Now, as bogus as that figure is, for various reasons, what it essentially means is 98% of uh, professional people do not want to be subjected to a vicious public character assassination, potential career ruination. As so, well so I must stop you there. I think you're drifting way outside the motion that's in front of us tonight. It's about climate change, is it, is it not? Pardon? It's about yeah, climate change. You're now it? drifting. What we're on about is this council and how we're tackling it. Oh. I don't think we're on about whether climate, tra climate change and the causes of it. We are talking about this council and what we propose to do. And it, please, can you keep your comments within that? I know there's a lot bigger issue, but that's for national government. It is not for the district council. Oh, please. Respectfully, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting we should uh, consider whether we're voting on something with a legitimacy, which is uh, in doubt. Thank you. Before we consider things that tax, taxing people and things like that. As I say, you know, people, people are subject to career ruination and all kinds of uh, public vilification. Uh, I'm going to drop a couple of names, if I may. No, no, you can't start any of that, please. Oh, I, I think you've had your opportunity. We know where you're coming from, and I think it's time to move on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Councillor Chris Pond. Chairman, well, you'll be glad to know probably I'm not going to go through all 18 clauses of this one by one. Um, but I will state that in contradiction to the member who spoke last, I do entirely agree with this motion. Uh, I, I think that it, this is an extremely important subject and I'm glad it's on the order paper tonight for us to discuss. The one thing I would say is that it's very easy, uh, as um, Councillor Whitehouse mentioned, uh, to pass these motions but not to see them into practical uh, fruition. And for those reasons, I would like to suggest the setting up either of a specialist uh, task and finish panel or a portfolio holder advisory group. Um, in relation to items 17 and 18, where I think we can make um, very quick changes, particularly on air quality. And as you know, Loughton Town Council uh, a couple of years ago had a motion on this at the Essex Association of Local Councils, 
which was agreed to, and uh, uh, similar uh, comments were made in the County Council. A task and finish group was set up there, which made recommendations, but what is always lacking is the impetus to see those recommendations into action. And I wouldn't like to see us simply pay lip service to this. Thank you. We, you'll be responding to that. Thank you. Councillor McIver. Thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to say I'm incredibly proud of our council uh, for this motion tonight. And I think we set a really good example to businesses and other organisations in our district that it, and beyond that it is possible to take note of the global emergency that we discussed tonight. Um, and I absolutely welcome the involvement, the further involvement of our youth council uh, with this bigger issue. And I think that will have a real long term benefit for what we're discussing tonight. Thank you. Councillor Baldwin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes. Um, I, just, I just have to start by saying that um, we do have one thing in our district which is a great weapon in the fight against climate change, and that is trees. Um, because um, I know, I'm very pleased to note that um, in the Epping Forest that they have planted many, many trees over, over the years, and it is a, a great weapon in the fight against climate change. And we are very fortunate in our district to have a large um, area of, uh, of ancient forest. Um, I'll just keep things within the remit of um, our district. Um, that, uh, I know that there was a Climate Change Act in 2008, but that did not um, impel local authorities to um, undertake um, measures to limit to limit um, CO2 emissions or what is within our remit is fairly limited and I do realise obviously that other things are within the remit of the County Council and, Nash and, and nationally I won't talk about that. Um, I do agree with Stephen Murray's comment earlier that um, the shopping park, great though it is, I do think it has enormously in, in, inadequate access for, 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 cy for, cycle, for cycling for pedestrians, and that we, we could have done, and maybe we could, we, we should do more to you know, to make it more accessible for people who to, to use non-motorised transport. And I think in general we could do a lot to make our district less friendly to the motor car and a lot more friendly to the pedestrian. And I mean by that, you know, that we should we should um, through the Epic Voice Liaison Committee, which I'm on, but we should do a lot more to create proper, safe cycle paths. I, 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 I refuse myself to cycle on these uh, narrow roads because I think it's very hazardous and dangerous, and I admire cyclists who take their lives into their hands. I think we could do so much more to facilitate cycling as a form of recreation and as a form of transport as an alternative to using the motor car. Another thing I'd like to, to see is a 20 mile an hour speed limit a residential speed limit because I believe not only would this increase safety uh, but it would also reduce emissions and I think that was discussed in the council some years ago but I would like to see that come back to the council for reconsideration because I do think that would make a great difference to uh, our quality of lives. Um, I, I think the council are doing some some excellent things. It's, it's not all bad. We're doing, we're doing some of the right things. I'm very excited to hear that um, Councillor Phillips said about sustainable transport corridors. And wow, if only, you know, if we could reduce 60% of all journeys um, take, you know, uh, um, taken by private vehicle transport, that would be a fantastic thing to achieve. And, and certainly, I think it's not just a question of um, pr uh, having more EV points, but I think we also do need to reduce our use of private transport as much as we possibly can. We need to incentivise people not to use the cars for short journeys and, um, you know, anyway. Um, other things I'd like to say is, um, I think Chris, I think uh, Councillor Paul must be reading my mind because I was going to suggest, and we have not liaised, that we have, because this is such an important issue, that we have a, um, a portfolio member, a cabinet member, who is responsible for climate change in order to implement this and push this forward in our district. I think that would be a good initiative. So I would like to um, second that. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Chairman. I'm just gonna declare an interest actually because uh, Aramco I do business with. Um, some comments have been mentioned, so I'm just not gonna vote. Thank you very much. I think we'll come back to you, Councillor Phillip. 
Thank you, Chairman. And I'm really pleased that uh, across the Council we have a feeling that this is something that we want to do. It's something that I've been talking about with uh, my officers for a while, particularly in the context of the local plan. It's uh, synergistic, I think, perhaps, that Council Level and I both put forward motions on climate change at more or less the same time. And it's really useful that we actually managed to find a way to both bring forward a single motion showing unanimity across the Council. Because realistically, it's only by working together that we'll actually be able to do anything. Um, it, it's unfortunate that Councillor uh, Murray started off by saying that he was an optimist and then spent most of his speech being pessimistic. <laughs> um, I genuinely do not believe that it's, not, that it's too late. It's getting close. It's certainly getting close, but I don't think we're there yet. There are certainly many retail parks that are badly designed and have a single uh, in-out. I can think of a couple in the Beckton area, for example, that have exactly that. Um, some of uh, that we can claim responsibility for, which we should, where it's our fault, and sometimes with the transport area, it's uh, the road authority that does it for us, and we don't always believe that Essex County Highways get everything right. Uh, glad to hear about Little Picks in Waltham Abbey. We've got one the first side of every month in Theden Boys, but that's not what this is about, really. Implementing action on climate change is important. There are a number of things that we as a council have already done. It's not enough. We need to keep moving in that direction. We've got these bottles instead of single-use plastic bottles. We've got solar panels on the roof of the council building and on council houses. We're moving from a paper agenda to paperless agenda. All of these are steps in the right direction. That's, I think, what we need to do. It's not simply a case of getting electric vehicles, although we have electric vehicles in the council, and I know some of our senior officers themselves drive electric vehicles. There is, of course, the debate, which I have with one of my colleagues, about whether electric vehicles are genuinely the future. Um, they may not be. They may be. It's interesting to follow the technology and see which is the charging technology that's actually going to win out. And it's a bit like the VHS Beta Max argument right at the beginning. We can't make a decision on that one yet. I think you're quite right. One of the keys is moving out of private vehicles. Now, that does mean that we as a council have to start thinking some of the more difficult thoughts. We have to start accepting, in some cases, uh, developments that do not allow for cars on that site. We have to look at some of the developments that we're doing as a council and actually under-provide car parking rather than over-provide car parking. But because it's only by doing almost a carrot and stick approach that you can actually change people's behaviour. I'm optimistic. Cycling, yes, I agree. I'm not certain I necessarily agree about the speed limits, but that is a county council thing for us to do anyway. Sustainable transport, important. Great to be able to deliver it in the garden town because they are actually structured in such a way that we can make those corridors. We have an issue around the forest. We cannot get any land from the forest, even if it makes ecological sense to do so by reducing the pressure and the congestion. They will not allow us to do that. So that is a real problem, but we will continue to work with it. Coming back to Councillor Pond's point of view, uh, no, I genuinely don't believe that we need a portfolio holder group or a task and finish panel because the clauses he was referring to are fully covered in the remit of the local plan cabinet committee. Uh, that's the way we'll be doing it. Um, given that I'm the seconder for this motion, given that there's a lot of sustainability, I suspect that the leader pushed to have a climate change representative on the cabinet will be looking in my direction. Uh, certainly at the moment that is something that I'm interested in. We want to drive this forward. We want to keep doing things with it. That's one of the reasons why I particularly wanted to get that air quality strategy into this motion so that we've actually bought up to doing stuff that makes the air quality in this district better and it helps us there and it helps us with the forest. 
But we've got to remember it's not just that. And that's why the sustainability guidance for development is so important. We are going to have a significant amount of development that has a significant carbon footprint. All that we can do as a district council, and that's one of the levers that we do have, all that we can do as a district council from that point of view to make things better there has to be better for the environment. Chairman, I urge the council to support this motion. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to have a show of hands on this. Mr. Torps. Yes, Chairman, that's, that's entirely appropriate. If, if members wish to vote on the, um, the motion that's before the, uh, the council this evening with the addition of the, uh, the amendment or the addition to the motion, then, then you can call for a show of hands. Yes, yes thank you. Can, can I have a show of hands of all those in favour of this motion with the amendment? Thank you. Those against? Any abstentions? I know, Councillor Owen. The motion is carried with one objector. Thank you. Okay, moving on. <coughs> Item 11, Asset Management Strategy, per Property Acquisition Strategy, pages 119 and 120, Councillor Patel, I think this one's you. Thank you, Chairman. Part of the asset management strategy, which was adopted by Cabinet in June, includes the acquisition of investment properties and development opportunities. In order to implement this strategy, the Council needs the ability to make timely decisions and the available access to capital to complete such transactions in a, comp in a competitive bidding situation. It is within this context that the pro property acquisition strategy has been prepared. The strategy paper was discussed at the Cabinet meeting earlier this month and Cabinet recommends Council approval and endorsement of an option to call on supplementary capital of up to £30 million for the purpose of general investment opportunities meeting the criteria outlined in the asset management strategy. I therefore ask that Council adopt the recommendation from Cabinet. Thank you. Members, any uh, questions on this or any comments? Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. I support the strategy to buy property. I asked the question of the portfolio holder, Councillor Patel. Is the strategy just to purchase property in the Epping Forest district or is it a wider mandate? And I have expressed concerns about the balance of retail investment in the portfolio. I know there's, there's business going on in that way, but I do think we do need diversification. Councillor Patel. Uh, thank you for your uh, question, Councillor Kaufman. Um, I agree with uh, you. We do need diversity within our, our portfolio. Um, and the, the first question I think would be about the land. Are we just sticking to the borough, not sticking to the district? Um, the, 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 as part of the, in the strategy document, it does outline that we, there is an um, it does enable us to be able to purchase property from um, outside of the, the district. Thank you. Councillor John Whitehouse. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I mean, the report talks about the criteria in the asset management strategy agreed in June. I think it would be helpful if the criteria had been reproduced in the report, um, but an investment management strategy was discussed. I mean, it talks about the type of criteria, location, lot size, sector, leaf length, covenant strength, socio social economic benefit, regeneration potential, investment yield, um, etc. cetera. Um, it's not very clear um, what the constraints, I mean, those are the, those are the criteria which we evaluated. It's not particularly clear what the, um, yeah, what meeting the criteria um, means. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, big or small uh, lot size locations, as we just heard, in a, outside the dis district sectors and so forth. And apart from wanting good investment returns, it'd be helpful to hear a little bit more about what the characteristics of the sort of property you're looking to invest in are. Thank you. Councillor Patel. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Whitehouse. The, um, 
The strategy was uh, was attached to the report that went to Cabinet, which I believe you attended as well. The, in, in terms of what you're asking, the, there is a clear, as part of the, uh, the strategy, there is a clear governance structure around um, what, what constitutes um, uh, there's, there's certain criteria that we must follow. Um, and this, th 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 this will be carried out um, with an investment appraisal uh, process and uh, business plans will be drawn up accordingly. So decisions will be made on, on that basis. Thank you. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. I wasn't able to get to Cabinet, but I do remember reading the agenda. Uh, what was it actually agreed in terms of this strategy about who would actually make the decisions about purchase? Because it did seem to me that the Cabinet agenda was suggesting that it might be left to just a few uh, members who would then subsequently report to Cabinet. Could I be reminded, please, what the actual position is in terms of uh, who would actually make the decisions around any one acquis acquisition? Because that worried me when I read the Cabinet agenda. Councillor Patel. Thank you for your um, question, Councillor Murray. Um, the decision will be well, will be made by uh, myself and uh, Councillor Stavrou in consultation with the leader. But again, our decision will be based on the governance structure that's set out in the asset management strategy. Thank you. Councillor Baldwin. Oh, sorry, just one second. Councillor Murray, you obviously want to come back. Come back. Uh, I wasn't able to say this as Cabinet because I wasn't uh, able to get to Cabinet. Uh, I'm not happy with that. Uh, I accept that they would keep the guidelines, I accept they would keep the parameters, and I accept that they would be uh, well-intentioned and it's nothing to do with the three individuals, it's the three posts. I'm not happy with uh, acquisition decisions of this size and this nature being taken by three members of uh, council, so I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Did you want to come back on that one? Councillor Patel? Um, I'd just like to make the point that we need to make decisions in a timely manner and obviously our decision making process it will be through due diligence and uh, these decisions won't be made in haste. Thank you. Councillor Baldwin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, just briefly, I'd just like to ask um, Councillor Patel, Councillor Patel, um, if the investment is um, financed really from the housing revenue account, or are we actually borrowing to invest here? That's one question. And a sub, uh, second question is, um, are we allowed to invest in any, or what asset classes are we allowed to invest in? Because obviously, as Councillor Kaufman has said, uh, mentioned retail, <coughs> retail assets um, within the district. But I just wonder if there are any other asset classes that we're allowed to invest in, by which I mean uh, sort of, uh, bonds or shares or you know different, different classes of asset. Councillor Patel. Thank you for your question, Councillor Baldwin. Um, the we will be looking to purchase um, investment properties um, and development opportunities. In terms of the the class, um, obviously that's dependent on the, the what's in our portfolio at that time. Um, we will be making balanced decisions on um, the, what, what is within our portfolio and, and ensuring that we have a good balance which minimises the risk to the council. Thank you. Councillor Mahindra. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I didn't initially intend to speak to this paper, um, but I did want to give uh, members some reassurance. Um, I'm not actually involved in this particular project, but uh, with my other hat on at Essex County Council, I'm the lead member for finance, property and housing. Um, we do have a similar structure in terms of investment, um, and we do get uh, decent investment returns. Um, I think it's fair to say that this council remains prudent on their finances. Um, to suggest a £30 million fund to start um, is exactly the right way to do it. Um, I share some concerns that Councillor Murray has alluded to in terms of governance, and I'm sure there will be several people in this chamber keeping a, a close eye on the returns and, and the risk profile. Um, as long as we don't end up like uh, Spellthorn, which is a similar size district council, which has a billion pound 
uh, property empire and regular conversations with the cha former Chancellor now, um, I'm sure our residents will be happy that we are making best use of the low interest rates on offer at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Janet Whitehouse. Sorry. Thank you. Oh. Chairman, I understand what Councillor Patel said about the need to make quick decisions, and that's the reason why only three people are going to be involved in, in making these decisions. But how much information are we going to get about these things? I mean, things like St John's Road, you know, all this discussion's going on, but even we as local Epping councillors have heard nothing about it. You know, you can feel very shut out of these big decisions. So how, how much are we going to hear? What feedback are we going to get about these big uh, financial decisions? Councillor Patel. Thank you for your question, um, Councillor Whitehouse. The, in the Cabinet papers that, um, um, that we had, um, we, we uh, explained a, an opportunity that was, um, was missed at the time um, for a site uh, that, was, um, that became available. And unfortunately, the, the problem the Council has is that we are unable to compete um, in our current situation with, uh, with developers um, when, when opportunities arise. And decisions therefore need to be made timely so that we can get the best uh, for our residents. As uh, the leader alluded to in his, um, in his report at the beginning of the, the meeting, we want to realise the best value from our, our, our property and asset. Um, so that we can safeguard our residents' uh, long-term futures from um, any potential cuts and, and the services that we provide. Um, I appreciate uh, there is a level of concern um, regarding um, awareness about these issues, but I'm not sure around the, the Constitution, um, and I'm, I'm looking for some advice, but this would follow the normal process whereby if a decision is made, um, it would be that there is an opportunity for a call-in. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, I, d I think it would depend on what the agreed process is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not an executive decision, no. I believe, and therefore I don't think the calling yeah, no, process okay. will apply. But I, I'm sure there will be strict governance on any large purchase that we might want to make and quite a lot of discussion would go on. Um, that would be the normal method, but uh, um, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? No, that's fine, thank you. Thank you, Cow Councillor Caroline Pond. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about the call-in as well. I mean, I'm a bit disappointed that, um, disappointed that that wouldn't fall in. And could I ask about staff? Have we got enough staff and enough experienced staff to deal with these sort of issues? Councillor Patel. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pond, for your question. Um, we, we, our estates team are, um, are uh, well experienced in this field and, and are comfortable um, with the, the number of staff that we have to be able to deal with any opportunities that arise. Thank you. Councillor John Whitehouse. Yeah, I just want to clarify something you just said, Chairman. If it's not an executive decision, I and mean, clearly it's not a council decision, so what sort of decision is it? I, I think we most probably will have to clarify exactly what's going on there. Um, I think Mr. Taltz is having a long thought at the moment. <laughs> but uh, can I come back to you in just a moment? Don't we have a monitor officer to answer these sort of questions? Yeah. Sorry? Just one second, I apologise for the slight delay. Uh, have we got any reply on that? Or can I come back to you on that one in just a moment so we can keep the meeting moving? Councillor Bob Jennings. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's really a question that, uh, following on from Councillor Caroline Pond's question, 
um, about the skills and experience that the council has. Um, I have to admit that I'm slightly concerned about officers dealing with this on their own. I would like to know whether or not you intend to take external professional advice. <coughs> Councillor Patel. The figure quoted, obviously, with the £30 million is, is the maximum that we are looking for. So whatever opportunities arise will obviously vary in, in, in size, scale, etc. Um, if there is a need, uh, if, if, if there is a need to bring in uh, specialist uh, support, we, we will of course do that. However, I don't envisage an influx of opportunities to arise because that would be against our risk strategy. So, Councillor Whitbread, I think you've got a point of clarification coming in. No, not a point of clarification. I, I think, well, partly, I think um, the, the main decision that we're taking this evening is on the 30 million. After that, that, that's the executive decision is on the 30 million. After that, it becomes an operational decision. And one of the things I would say with regards to some clarity on our operational ability to, to deliver on this, we've already been doing it to a degree. If you look at what we've done with the Epping Forest Shopping Park, what we're doing on St John's Road, what we've done with the Council House Building Programme, these are all the type of things that we're already doing. What we're looking to do, in order to drive revenue forward for the future and improve the, the Council's investment position, we're looking to do it on a more regular basis. If you're going out to the open market, you can't wait for a cycle of meetings. You, you have to be able to move. And therefore, it's been put in this, in this way, so the executive decision is to put the sum of money in place. The operational decision is on how are you going to push this through. I'll give you a for instance, one of, the, one of the, 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 the sites that we're interested in at the moment and moving forward on, if we'd gone through the long process, we wouldn't have been ready to exchange contracts by the time we got around a cycle of meetings. And, and we've seen it as a council before, I've seen this many times in local authorities, where we're slow, so slow to respond. Um, to to give, a, give an example, if you look at uh, leisure services, where leisure services was run by us, it used to take us six months to decide on how we were going to run, run a gym, let alone make a property move. So actually this is a modern way of working that other councils have done and we're just following what the process is that other people have done. The executive decision is in the um, making the 30 million, the operational is actually making decisions on the sites. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Councillor Whitehouse, does that answer some of your question? Well, so whilst it's went to constitution training, but as an, I understand it, all decisions are the executive decisions, you know, delegated sometimes as appropriate, or council decisions you know, made by councils or committees of the council. And all I want to establish is what sort of decision would this be, who would actually be the decision maker, and who would um, you know, be accountable. And the question that still hasn't been answered about is there a call in process? Or not? I mean, I'm guessing there wouldn't be because of the speed um, requirement. But uh, you know, these should be very basic, I thought, constitutional questions. Yeah, I, and uh, as I say, there we've got the bit that this is the ability to use this fund, not what it is used on, which is what you're saying you'd want overview and screw or some sort of scrutiny and governance on that. Which, as uh, Councillor Phillip said, would be the operational side. And I think Councillor Phillip wants yeah, to explain. I, 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 Councillor Whitehouse is right. There are a number of different uh, decision-making approaches within um, <coughs> within the Constitution. Councillor Whitehouse, you, you also forgot the regulatory decisions, which don't fall into either of those and are, in fact, not callable in. I think, in a lot of ways, this, this is similar to setting a budget for a particular activity. Once you've got that budget set, how it actually broken down within uh, carrying that out is not something we tend to get involved in as a council. Uh, council Whitbread is, is correct. What, you, what we're doing here as a council, we're saying we're putting a pot of 30 million to invest. How we choose, how we actually carry that investment out uh, on the individual parts is something that we ca carried out in an operational way. But I'm quite convinced that it will be done under the regulation of the monitoring officer. It will be done under regulation of the section 151 officer. And whenever a decision is made and money is spent, uh, and we get to the point where it is no longer private, uh, the portfolio holder will re report back to um, either cabinet or council, depending which way is the best route. That then can be scrutinized. 
if we see a pattern of things going wrong, or if we're breaking the budget, well, we can't break the budget because that would be ultra virus. so it will be within the budget, we'll get reports on what ha happens, and that's how we'll scrutinise what goes on. Thank you. Councillor Colfman. Thank you, Chair. Let me come back. I, I think um, it's really if the council has got an, uh, an investment strategy, which it has, which everyone has bought into, which they have, then it's a sensible enough approach. Uh, I would think that there should be a little bit more awareness amongst whoever is chosen when big decisions are contemplated after being made. Um, and I, I do think that the investment world is changing. There are a number of boroughs, absolutely not this one, that have been um, reckless in what they've done. They haven't had proper advice. They've spent far too much money, and values can go down as well as go up, and they're more likely to go down at the moment. What the council is doing is actually prudent and sensible, but I think there should be a little bit more awareness. But it, it cannot wait for a call in. Decisions and exchange of contracts will take place, otherwise the council can't be competitive. So I just think a little bit more awareness possibly to a, f a smaller group at some stage, and a constant review of the investment policy. Thank you. Councillor John Knapman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my natural inclination has always been that we should be a debt-free council, and for a long time we took a lot of pride in being a debt-free council. But that was at a time when interest rates were not at historically low levels as they are now. What I think gives me some comfort in this is that we are talking about borrowing 40 years at fixed interest rates. Uh, to do anything else would be reckless. Um, interest rates, where they're going to go in the future and over 40 years, I'm certainly not prepared to make a guess. And I remind people that we've had interest rates and mortgage rates of 15% and we're looking at mortgage rates at the moment, you might be able to get 2-3%. Um, so I think the absolute key to this is that we minimise the risk to this council of taking what is a risk strategy. Um, it involves borrowing money and it involves things can go wrong. But uh, if we can borrow at the low interest rates that we are, and if we can borrow that at a fixed rate for 40 years, then I have less worry about this because I think councils have got to start showing imagination on how they might get extra revenue. You know, if we've got too many natural Englands around, uh, we'll be losing revenue right, left and centre because, believe it or not, we are developing a political system which cannot make decisions. And uh, the biggest decision of all, we at the moment cannot make a decision on it. And that kind of lethargy is going to be the thing that threatens this economy. Um, I certainly will support this because we are not talking about um, uh, a sum of money which will actually put this council at, in real jeopardy. Um, I think I am I'm reminded to say that I have a little bit of concern about we need to make speed of decision. I think the important thing about the speed of decision is that there are people looking at that decision later on to say, did we get it right? Where, if we get one wrong, and then there's every chance we, we might, um, that we can have a look at, like the audit and governance can look at this and say where things might have gone wrong, why it might have been done better, whatever. But uh, I think it's a pretty bold initiative at a time when I think, um, given the interest rates, we can afford to take such a bold initiative. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Stavro. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I was reluctant to jump in as so um, Councillor Patel is doing so well. But just want to reassure the uh, members that we've always been a prudent council. But the, the way the local authorities now have to um, get their revenue is changing. We cannot sit down and expect the government to keep handing out money. Because you can see for yourself in the history of uh, the finances of this council that over the last three, four, five years, we've actually virtually lost all our government funding. So we have to be innovative. But of course we're not going to take unnecessary risks. We're not a, a council that is going to rush out, borrow 30 million, from the Public Works um, Loan Board and go out and fritter it away 
on schemes that are, uh, seem too good to be true at the time. We've got a very good Section 151 officer, and we've got other professionals on board now, which are very, very careful looking at everything we do and monitoring the risk. Yes, of course, there is risk, but if we don't actually do something to ensure that we have a steady stream of income coming in, we are not going to be, to be able to continue to provide our residents with the service that they expect and deserve as residents of Epping Forest District Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Murray. Come back because the argument or the debate has moved on. I'm even more concerned than I was at the start of the debate. I had a fairly low level of concern, but now that I've heard more about it, uh, I'm getting even more concerned. Uh, the way I understood Councillor Phillips arguing is that we would only have other members I'm talking about would only really have an input about judging decisions if a pattern of poor decisions emerged. There is no mechanism for other members to have any input or effect on any purchasing decision that is made by the three. So I'm not at all happy with this. And let me spell it out please for Councillor Mrs Whitehouse because she's asked this question twice about St John's. It would be my view and I think I can provide some evidence, but I would rather not do that in the chamber. You won't find it written down anywhere, but my feeling, and I'm not going to fight your battles, mm -hmm. but my feeling is that you three councillors, who are very knowledgeable about Epping, have quite deliberately, quite deliberately been frozen out over the St John's development. That is how I feel, and I've got some evidence behind that statement. So it comes as no surprise to me that... Uh, that is happening, and if they're prepared to do that over St John's, with all your knowledge and all your contacts within the town, and understanding about what would be good, just like other Epping councillors, uh, I'm very worried about this whole process, and I will want my vote recorded against. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stavry, you indicated you wanted to come back on that. Yes, just a quick um, response, actually. I think it's, it's implausible to expect um, the council to have to keep coming back to committee every time an investment opportunity arises. That way we absolutely tie our hands. And I don't think that we could compete in the commercial environment in that case. And on the same subject? Okay, Councillor <laughs> Chairman, I'm proposing that we actually move to a vote. Sorry, I've only got two more speakers. Please, I'll, I will hear those. Councillor Wixley and then Councillor Whitehouse. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think I can understand the need to do, do deals quickly. No, never. So I've got a concern no. because um, we're talking about uh, a fund of £30 million. Pounds. I wonder if there are any thoughts in order to minimise risk, how much of that £30 million is going to be spent on any particular deal? Uh, is there any idea of, is there some sort of limit on what we would spend on any particular deal? Would this be spread over six purchases or would it be, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about what somebody has said about fritting money away. I'm, I'm sure everybody would be cautious, but I think that is a thing. But the other, the other thing I'd also, because we're only really going to be able to scrutinise this after the deal has taken place. So I do have those concerns, but I'm hoping for reassurance. Thank you. Councillor Patel. Thank you, Councillor Wixley. It's very difficult to stipulate the number of transactions that can take place for, for that sum of money. Um, I, I mean, the, as you would have seen from the Cabinet Papers, the opportunity that arose uh, would have taken um, a large proportion of that money away. So. For, for me, it's more about what's going to realise the most value for, for our residents, what's going to give us the best return from the investment that we're making. If, if, obviously, that there is a risk, uh, that there is risk with, it, with any transaction, and this will all be factored in when we make those decisions. Thank you. Councillor Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. As I before, I accept the fact that a quick decision's got to be made. But once that decision has been made, 
then there will be decisions to be made about how the property is going to be developed. And I can't see why that's got to be so secret. You know, Councillor Pond suggested a portfolio advisory group. That can meet at, you know, any time. It doesn't have to meet the council cycle, which I can see is difficult. And, and I just don't, don't accept the fact that, you know, we can't be more involved in these big decisions. Uh, if we have something like a portfolio holder advisory. If you, if you take the Loughton Retail Park, which has come up twice this evening, if there had been some sort of input from local councillors there, maybe some of the problems that have been discussed tonight about the hold-ups at the junction and the need for other sorts of accessibility with, with cycling and so forth would have been brought up by the councillors and these problems would have been avoided. So I'm not happy with the, the involvement of other councillors in these big decisions after they've been made. I, I'm going to have one more, and that's Councillor Whitbread's going to uh, finish up. Chair, this, this um, debate is exactly the reason why we need to take these actions in order to be able to move on things quickly. But once we've actually agreed something and we've, we've brought an opportunity, then there'll be the Asset Management Cabinet Committee, there'll be reports to Cabinet, there'll be planning applications, a whole range of issues. We spent months and years on the Epping Forest Shopping Park. Reports came back and forth to Council, Cabinet, uh, through the planning process, a whole range of issues. No one is kept in the dark. When you're actually in negotiation phases, sometimes you have to work with a tight team who can move quickly. And that's all we're doing. We're setting up the executive decision to have a budget in place. We don't know what opportunities are out there at the moment. We know of one opportunity, but you don't know what other opportunities will arise. You don't know what the size of those opportunities will be. Maybe we have to come back to the council and say, actually, there's a wonderful opportunity come up, and it's bigger than what we've got. Can we, can we, can we change the parameters? You just don't know. But the actual fact is we need to be able to move quickly. But once you've actually moved quickly and you've acquired something, then there's a whole range of processes this, this council goes through. We had... To, to say that people weren't consulted fully on the Epping Forest shopping park, and there wasn't numerous um, opportunities through the planning application stage and such, is just ridiculous, and actually makes a mockery of this council and the councillors who say it, that everyone was consulted very, very well. With regards to St John's Road, I think it's important that Councillor Murray gets this straight. At the moment, it's been dealt with through the Cabinet... And the Cabinet are talking to the Town Council and members of the Town Council who have set up their own committee, which is the due process of a Town Council, and we are in negotiations with it. And therefore, it takes time and process, and we don't want it being splashed out in the wrong places whilst we're in very, very delicate negotiations. It's important that things are dealt with properly and professionally in that manner, and that wouldn't happen if we, if we took another approach. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go to the vote now on a show of hands on this one. Uh, the recommendation is before you. Those in favour, please signify in the normal manner. Those against? Abstentions? Chairman, the voting on that uh, recommendation was 35 votes for, two against, and six abstentions. Uh, the motion is carried. Moving on. <clears throat> Item 12, representation on outside organisations, leader appointments. Councillor Whitbread. Thank you, Chairman. Just a tidying up exercise, Chairman. Um, can I just make to, one change to the, uh, the um, appointments to be noted? Um, on B, it should read Economic Board, Councillor A. Patel and Councillor N. Bevard. Okay. With that one change, can we note it? Thank you. Item 13, uh, appointment of cooperative member uh, to the Audit and Governments Committee. I think this is you, Mr. Uh, Councillor Knappman. Yes, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, the reason for this um, is because one of the two co-opted members 
who are not actually councillors, um, has come to the end of their term of office. So we need to um, set up an appointment um, panel to find a new co-opted member. Or, um, what we've, it's been decided that if no one comes forward, um, then we will look to carry on with the current co-opted member. Uh, the co-opted members have played a very important role on audit and committee, and they give, give a, an outsider opinion, which I think is really, really necessary. Um, just a couple of things I need to add to this, and that is that the, um, the four members of the panel uh, will be myself, Councillor Jennings, Councillor Heap, and Councillor John Whitehouse, um, are the people who have been put forward. Um, I would certainly recommend that as a, a very good panel to make it the interviews on this as they become necessary. Um, and as you also see, that um, we are advising that we would like, as an advisor on that, the other co-opted member, um, Nora Nane. Your core, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I've got my glasses on. I've never had to say her surname very often, because um, I call her Nora, you just see why. And it's Nana Yakora. Um, and she will be asked to sit as an advisor, but not as non-voting. Um, so I hope you can see that this is something that is absolutely necessary now, and you'll give it your support. Thank you. Thank you. Can we agree that uh, recommendation? Thank you. Uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Councillor Jennings, I believe. Oh, sorry? Is that for the Overview and Scrutiny? Yeah, I was just going to give him a chance to speak first. <laughs> sorry. Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think many members will be aware of the fact that the last uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee meeting was actually cancelled. Whoops, sorry. Following the Agenda Planning Group, which takes place obviously prior to that committee. It was determined because of the Council's um, inability to attract um, an external partner organisation to attend, combined with the fact that the three select committees hadn't met, um, there would be very little, and therefore the Chairman, Councillor Mary Sartin, together with the Chief Executive, determined that it would be better to cancel that. Not an ideal situation. Um, but it's one of those things that we're left with, and I look, like to look upon this as a bit of a glitch rather than uh, a thing that will occur again. Thank you. Councillor Whitehouse. Yes, Chairman, I just wanted to express uh, my concern and, and that of some other members too, that the last Ernest uh, Overing Scrutiny Committee was cancelled. Uh, Councillor Jennings says this because the external organisation couldn't come, but Overing Scrutiny has a reserve list of organisations that members want to question. And I just wonder whether any of those organisations on the reserve list were um, asked to come. Um, it, it is concerning, too, that um, there was no business to come to the um, Overview and Scrutiny. If it's only got to be things that have been to select committee, then maybe the terms of reference need to be looked at again, because we've reduced the scrutiny select committees from four to three. There's so little opportunity to do scrutiny now that you know, we need to look perhaps at a, a C and see if it's really making the best use of the time it has. But I just want to be assured that no more OSC meetings in the civic year are going to be cancelled. Thank you. Councillor Jennings, can you come back on that at all? Or? Well, yes. Uh, I would only say that obviously I completely agree with Councillor Whitehouse that mm. I would be very disappointed if this happened again. And I, as I said in my uh, introduction, I, I do view this as a glitch, and certainly I think we will aim that this does not happen. I think it's a programming issue rather than um, something a little bit more sinister. Thank you. Councillor Murray. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm not only disappointed, I'm extremely angry, actually. Uh, the Chairman of ONS knows my feelings because she's had a very polite email from me about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about a number of issues, but I would want to just assure members that in virtually every other aspect of my life, I'm very positive, very happy, and, and enjoy things. <laughs> but I just come across here a bit as Mr. Angry, but I am angry about this. ONS is one of the few vehicles that non-conservative members have to influence this council, because they don't attend conservative group meetings. ONS is one of the few vehicles that backbench members of the Conservative group have to 
influence things. So to cancel a meeting, with all due respect, Councillor Jennings, and I know you weren't involved in the decision and we're examining the process of the, of the decision, or how the decision was made in a minute, was not a glitch, it was deliberate. A deliberate choice was made for the best of reasons, I accept that, so it's not a glitch, it can't be described as a glitch, it was a deliberate decision to cancel one of the very few meetings that non-executive members have to influence decisions. I'm not saying it's the only way, but if you ask most people, what's your role? Oh, I'm on ONS, I'm involved in the scrutiny function. So it's a very important division when you've got the executive. So there's two things to look at. First of all, I want to ask a question, and I know it can't be answered tonight, because uh, the chairman of ONS isn't here, but it has to be dealt with tonight, otherwise the issue is gone. How the decision was made. Fully agree that the decision was made in due process and nothing constitutionally was done wrong. But it was the chief exec and the chairman of ONS, who does happen to be a member of the same group as the executive. That's why I've never supported the idea of a chairman being the same party. Got no problem with the individual qualities. I'm not talking about the individual councillor here. I'm talking about perception. So the decision to cancel this ONS meeting was taken quite correctly constitutionally by the chief executive and the chairman of ONS, who happens to be the same. Uh, political party or persuasion as the executive. No attempt was made to sound out other members from across the chamber should we cancel ONS. Because if I had been asked, I'm not saying I should have been asked, I'm just saying if I had been asked, I would have certainly said no. I hadn't canvassed my other colleagues, but I get the idea that Councillor Whitehouse uh, wouldn't have agreed. And this idea that there wasn't anything for us to scrutinise or get down to in detail, I think it's been proved wrong tonight. If we can remember as far back as the fantastically interesting report that the Leader of Council gave us over all the things that have happened in the summer, well, that would have been a really useful thing to have had at that ONS meeting on the 3rd of September. Because as he spoke, I'm sure like other members, lots of detailed questions went through my mind. Well, what's this? What's that? What have we done here? Well, fantastic. Money going here. I've decided to give £50,000 to North World. Well, on what basis? Probably the right decision. But we could have been, you know, that could have been a really good meeting. We've had a discussion tonight on the Cabinet report about... What's the exact title? Item 11, where we just had the, uh, the vote. Uh, Asset, management. Asset management strategy. That's another thing that could have gone to that ONS meeting. Items that had been on the Cabinet before the ONS meeting that had been cancelled, and items that were on the agenda of the Cabinet meeting, either in the same week or the week after that ONS meeting, would have been fantastic material for scrutinising. So I'm really unhappy. It can't happen again, Chairman. I've registered my disquiet. Though I accept due process was followed, I think politically another con consultation should have been taken before it was cancelled. And this idea that there wasn't anything that we could have usefully scrutinised, well, I think uh, I've proved that that doesn't really hold water. So a very unhappy Councillor Murray. Councillor Knight. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to keep this really brief, unlike certain other councillors. Um, I just want to draw everybody's attention to something Councillor Murray um, alluded to. We have planning committees where every single person from every single party is on. Just make that point. We also have stronger council, stronger communities, stronger place, um, who are all meeting, have met, um, there are also scrutiny committees. Every single member in here is on those groups. Um, and I'd like to pose one question. Did Councillor Murray or did any members of other parties contact Councillor Sartin with appropriate suggestions 
of items that could be on that agenda. Did Councillor Murray phone Councillor Sartin and speak to her and try and rescue the meeting? Did you propose any outside bodies to attend? Did you invite anybody and ask them to attend and rescue the meeting? Thank you. Uh, I uh, go on then. I'll, I'll I'll keep short, time. As soon as we were informed that the meeting was cancelled, I responded to say that I was not happy and that there could have been things. I didn't go into detail, but I did make it clear that I wasn't happy. But we weren't given the chance to do that. That's what I'm saying. The decision to cancel was made before we had that opportunity. But I've made my point, Chairman. No, um, yeah, sorry. Councillor Knight, and then Councillor Mahindra, and then I'm going to wind this one up. Councillor Murray, it's all very well making insinuations about other councillors who are not here to defend themselves. You did not, as you've just said, phone Councillor Sartin, make a suggestion, put forward suggestions and try and rescue the meeting. If there was no other business on that agenda, there was no other business. Councillor Sartin would do her utmost to make sure that meeting would go ahead. She would never cancel that meeting willy-nilly. She has not done it for political motivations. I'll draw your attention to one thing. We have a planning committee, Plans West. Now, since May, unfortunately, two of those meetings since May have been cancelled, believe it or not, in our district, due to lack of business. Is that politically motivated? No, it's because there's nothing to put on that agenda. I don't appreciate members who are not here to defend themselves being accused of some kind of conspiracy and not putting forward a meeting. Thank you. Count Councillor Mahindra. Uh, I'm going to try and follow Councillor uh, Knight because I think she hit the nail on the head. Um, all members had at least two weeks' notice to say this overview and scrutiny meeting was cancelled as per the 16th of August Council Bulletin. There was um, reference to contacting Mr. Torts if you had any issues with that. And I do, I really am uncomfortable that um, Councillor Sartin has had criticism tonight when she's not here to defend herself. I don't think that's fair. Thank you. Okay, I, I think I'm going to close this now and say we understand the question, we understand the problem, it was unfortunate, and I think we need to go forward. So, um, I think it's time to move on. Item 15, um, calling emergency, sorry, urgency, proposed letting the land at Northfield Airfield to a Manchester's Revenue and Customs, pages 123-124, Councillor Patel. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, it's only to be noted, this item. Do you want to say anything? Councillor Whitbread. Yeah, Chairman, just to be noted, but it shows the fact why it couldn't have been scrutinised by a view and scrutiny, doesn't it? Someone's got their facts wrong again. Sorry, Councillor Patel. Uh, Ch Chairman Needle has um, alluded to this um, in his um, in his uh, leader update earlier. Um, so this um, this item's for noting. So can I take this as noted, please? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Whitehouse. One question, Chairman. One of the count, um, cabinet members, I think, alluded earlier to the fact that it was the the government, which gives itself planning permission for this use, was, was, did I hear that correctly earlier? And if so, for just is that a temporary planning permission? Does that change the planning status of the land? It's temporary. Okay. Yes, um, the, the, the government has the ability to take planning decisions uh, which it will have an inspector come in and actually make that dis planning decision, uh, not the local planning authority. And in this case, it's a two-year temporary planning permission uh, granted by the inspector to the government. We, as a local planning authority, were consulted. Uh, we have made representations. Um, Natural England, it may interest the chamber, was also consulted. Um, they believe they didn't have enough information provided to make a strong recommendation one way or another. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Item 16, joint arrangements for external organisations. I don't believe there are any. 
Uh, I have had a note from Councillor Whitbread that at a future meeting he will give an update from the Health and Wellbeing Board, but it won't be the next one, it will most probably be the one after. Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wonder if we could also have a report from the Epping Forest Liaison Group. Um, it's been in, in train a couple of years now. Um, I've never heard anything coming out of it, really. I would very much, you know, bearing in mind the number of wards which are affected by the Epping Forest area, I'd very much like to hear a report from one or other of the I, members. I'm not sure who actually sits on that. Councillor Whitbread. Yeah, Chairman. Sorry, Chairman, there's, there's a number on there as district councillors and a number of us as county councillors. In fact, we just met uh, two Fridays ago now, so um, I, I think it would be good and, and proper to actually have a report. I was also going to suggest that perhaps we have a report from the Essex Health and Wellbeing Board to see how that's progressing. I just said that one. Bearing in mind with the STP. Yeah, we'll just, Thank you. We'll just so um, we'll work out someone from that to actually give that. Thank you. Uh, exclusion of public and press, I don't think there is anything. I declare the meeting closed at 9.55.